All right. Well, I see at least three of you here. If you can hear me, you can go ahead and jump in if you like. I am Tiffany Ross, and I am going to do your last day of boot camp. I want to congratulate all of you all for your attendance so far. And today we are going to be finishing with the policies and procedures. All right. So if you are here, if you can hear me, if you will uh, just blink in for a second, at least so I can see your faces and make sure I can give you credit for your attendance. All right. Hi, Arturo. Good to see you. Thank you for joining. All right. Hi there, Jeff. Good to see you. Thank you for joining. No problem. Thank you. Good. And then Jennifer, if you're here, if you would pop in and again, just show on the screen for just a sec at least so that we know that um, you'll get credit for your attendance. All right. Well, again, thank you for, oh, there you are. Hey there. Okay. So thank you all for joining. We are going to start this morning with the presentation that you should be familiar with, with Teresa already. And um, that presentation is this one here. Uh, today's topic for the boot camp is the policies and procedures. All right. And so what we're going to talk about, there are several policies and procedures. There are Keller Williams Realty International <clears throat> policies and procedures that's a very lengthy and complicated document. We're not going to cover that one in detail today. So I'm going to show you where it is, how to find it in your mykwkw.com uh, back office. And then we are going to spend most of our time today talking about our local office policies. So these local office policies we're going to cover in detail together. And then afterwards, anyone who would like or needs a copy of these, uh, please make a note in the chat so that we can make sure that uh, they get out to you. I'm not sure if you've already received them, if she emailed a package to you all yet, or um, if you need to receive those. Okay. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about today is how to get help with compliance. If you need, uh, if you have issues with command or in an actual transaction, what your step should be to get the help that you need. Okay, so these are what we're going to cover today, starting with the first one, KWRI, Keller Williams Realty International. They have, again, a very intensive, probably about 90 page uh, policies and procedure, and this is where they're located. So they're in the mykwkw.com, your back agent, uh, which would be for our our office or our market center, and I'm actually going to show you in my own MyKW in just a second. Uh, then you will go to the office and then to documents and then to the policies and procedures. Okay, and so I am going to switch to my MyKW and I can show you exactly how to get there uh, for yourselves. So if you log in to mykw.com, your screen should look something like this, all right? And then once you scroll down, you're going to select at the bottom under the quick links, your market center. And our market center is 832. This is whether you are uh, choosing to operate out of the Mebane office, the Hillsborough office, or the Burlington office. We're all one market center. And so if you go here, it's going to take you to the intranet for this market center. All right. And then once you join or enter the intranet for our market center, you will need to select, again, market center. This is our office. And then you will come to documents. And then once you come to the documents here, you'll see a policies and procedures folder right there. And mind you, there are several other documents that might be of uh, interest to you when it comes to our market center. You have access to all of those documents in the intranet. So under policies and procedures, you're going to see the commercial manual. You'll see the commercial categories. You will see our 
uh, KW Central Policies and Procedures and the KWRI or the, the International Policies and Procedures. All right, so this is where you go to actually find, oh, they've updated it. So these are our local ones too. So you've got both of them right here, the National Manual and our local manual. So my job here is to show you where this National Manual is. Again, it's a very large document, lots of reading, if you choose to, um, to go with that particular uh, manual. Today, we are going to focus on this one, the KW Central Policies and Procedures. All right. Any questions so far? Did everybody follow how we got there? Don't forget this, uh, the video will be available if you'd like a copy of it later and you can follow along again. All right. So next we are going to um, I'm I'm sorry. This is Plummer. I'm following the link. My Kato, you know, the back office office documents and policies. The first, I don't see a link that says office. Okay, so if you would go to Market Center, it actually says Market Center. This one right here. This is what you're looking for. So it should say Market Center, not office. I'll tell Teresa so that she can update her slide. But then once you click that. Do you see the documents tab there? Are you good there, Plumber? I'm going to assume that no news is good news. Uh, and so once you get to, once you go through the market center and to documents, you'll see the policies and procedures about midway. All right, so going back to the slide here. And so again, instead of it saying office, uh, Teresa should have put market center there. Uh, so just make sure you make a note that that's what you're gonna go for. All right, so then next slide, we are going to dig into the KW Central Policies and Procedures. And again, as I mentioned, they are both in that same location. I am just gonna pull them up right now here in uh, Microsoft Word. And this is where we are going to spend the rest or the majority of the rest of our time together. Um, our local policies and procedures are approximately, um, I think it's 30, let's see, 30 different policies and procedures. Yep. And it's about 13 pages long. So these are what we're going to talk about together uh, so that you can understand how we are going to operate as a Burlington, uh, Hillsborough, and Mebbin off, uh, market center. So number one is about advertising. So our policies for advertising is that each agent is responsible for complying with the rules that you already know from the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. And of course, that's no blind ads. Um, all of your ads have to be BIC approved, uh, meaning that you have to make sure that you have the company name in all of your ads. And um, you also have to follow the MLS rules for, the, for listing service. So there are certain things you can and cannot have in the MLS. So make sure depending on which MLS that you take the time to learn what their specific rules are. Our market center is a member of three different MLSs. And so each of the rules for all three uh, are different. So make sure you understand and know the rules for the ones that you choose to join. You're also responsible for any um, compliance with Association of Realtor and the Code of Ethics rules. Uh, so make sure that you're familiar, you familiarize yourself or remind yourself of those rules, especially concerning advertising, such as not soliciting other agents' clients. Um, any third-party IDX or non-IDX rules, if you decide to join some other third-party uh, website and they're going to have IDX um, transmission or not, you need to make sure you understand what their rules are concerning marketing and advertising. The KWRI advertising rules, as again, I showed you where to find the KWRI rules, and you can look up their advertising to see if there's anything different 
uh, from ours. And then, of course, the federal and state advertising and fair housing laws that you have to be aware of. So, of course, non-discriminatory um, advertising and making sure that you abide by all of these rules and all of these laws. And I always like to keep it very simple. Keep your advertising about the property and not people and you will really dodge a lot of the areas where agents tend to get into trouble. Okay, so make sure your advertising is focused on the property. And of course, no blind ads. They need to know that you are a real estate professional. All right, there is an exhibit A that will give more details, more specifics on advertising uh, that is available to you all so that you can know uh, uh, basically all of these different rules sort of combined for your benefit. All right. Number two is agency agreement and contract policy. This is pretty short and sweet. All fully executed agreements have to be uploaded and submitted in command within 48 hours. That is our market center policy. The commission rule is that you have to submit them within 72 our market center would like for you to submit everything into command within 48 hours. We want you to do it really immediately. As soon as everything is available to you, go ahead and get in the habit of submitting those documents because we are not able to see or review and make sure that you're in compliance until they are actually submitted. And so it's not good enough just to load them in there. You do have to follow through and actually submit them before we would have access to ensure that you are in compliance, all right? That's number two. Number three, agent on duty. You all should have heard of and be familiar with the fact that you can, any agent in any of our market center or any of our offices rather, can choose to participate in the agent on duty program, okay? Any agent can schedule to be the agent on duty at any of our locations. So you could choose to be agent on duty in Burlington, uh, even or even in Hillsborough, even if you primarily work out of the Burlington location. The office hours for agent on duty in Burlington and Mebbin are nine to one for the first shift and one to five for the second shift, Monday through Friday. And then Burlington has Saturday at nine to five and Sunday nine to five. Mebbin, their Friday afternoon agent, is also on duty through the weekend. And Hillsborough the AOD hours are one to five, Monday through Friday, with the Friday agent being on duty throughout the weekend. All right. Now, the agent on duty does have to be in the office for the weekday duty, but not the weekend duty. So it will just go to your phone if you're the agent on duty, if there are calls that come through. OK, so if you want to participate in agent on duty, I've heard of some really great calls coming, a lot of wonderful leads, some really good transactions coming from uh, choosing to serve as an agent on duty. Uh, you can get scheduled for it and get more information about how to be agent on duty by uh, connecting with our director of communication. And that's front desk 832 at KW.com. All right. So I hope that all of you will give it a try and see uh, what it's like to do your agent on duty and what kind of benefits that you get uh, from answering questions that people have. It also really helps you to learn more yourself when you serve in that manner. Number four is agent support. This one's really important. If you have questions, if you're in the middle of the transaction and something comes up, then you don't know what to do. We want you to know how you can get help, how you can get support. So the support that's available for you uh, depends on what your need is. If it is a non-transaction specific question that you have, so it's not related to an actual transaction that you're in the middle of, you can call the BIC hotline. This BIC hotline always has someone on duty for to answer questions that you might have. And if they are not able to answer the question, then they will refer you directly to one of your BICs, okay? And so that BIC hotline number is 336-864-5991. All right, so that should be your first option if it's not related to a specific transaction. Now, if you have another question, another option for you is to email the BIC at brokerincharge832 at gmail.com. 
Now, it looked like someone was about to ask a question. Yes, I do. Um, okay. <laughs> thanks. So what if it is a transaction specific? Uh, so I ask because I'm a rookie. Okay. And if it's a transaction specific, um, um, would it be my coach? Would that be the first um, call or? You can um, because you are working with a coach. Now, if there are agents that don't have a coach or someone they could call directly um, for the transactional questions, we're asking you to start with an email to the broker in charge. So that's where we just were here. So Thank you can you. email the BIC. That would be the first thing. And if it's an emergency, then you may have to actually call um, your BIC. Okay. Uh, but we ask that you start with the email because we want you to be able to send some details about what's happening in the transaction so that we could read over and uh, possibly even research if necessary and give you um, a, an educated answer to help with, uh, because some of the transactional questions that come, you guys, you guys bring us some doozies sometimes. Um, and so it's better to have that paper trail in the event that we need to have additional protections or possibly uh, going forward with E&O insurance if necessary. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. You're welcome. Um, and then if you need anything that for signatures for anything, if you need uh, Primarily, we usually get the coming soon. Um, but if you have any documents that need a big signature, then you would send those documents already prepared, have, you know, have the signature boxes in place already, and send those documents to the same broker in charge 832 at gmail.com. And we will get those signed for you. You can expect an answer uh, on the BIC email daily. We do check it every day. Um, it will not be longer than 24 hours that you would get an answer. And if something is on fire, again, you can call the BIC directly in a case like that or text, uh, but we can't say that they, they, we would always be uh, able to catch us immediately. All right. Number five, our co-listing guidelines. Sometimes we have agents that want to uh, co-list with one another. Uh, and, and we encourage that. It's actually a good idea to help one another, partner with other like-minded agents. Uh, but if you do want to co-list, we do recommend that you decide how you're going to work together and perhaps put that in writing to make sure that there's no confusion uh, as transactions go along. But we do have some co-listing guidelines that we have established for you that you will need to follow if you're going to co-list with another agent, okay? And so number five is the co-listing guidelines. So co-listing a listing by two active agents within the company is permissible if the secondary listing agent signs and initials the listing agreement in every place that the primary listing agent signs. So to co-list a property, both agents have to sign the listing agreement. So that's the first step. Uh, and then the procedure for listing it in the MLS, it differs for each of the MLS. And so we have them each lined out here for you. In Alamance, you are only permitted to co-list with agents who are members of the AMLS. And so it's important that you both are members of AMLS if you're co-listing together in the Alamance MLS. Okay. For a triad, Co-listings are permitted as long as the BICs are both Triad MLS members. And in our case, um, our, you know, we are a member of Triangle, Triad, and AMLS. And so as long as you co-list with another agent whose BIC is a member of Triad, it, it means even outside of our firm. Now, of course, we would want you to work primarily with other firm agents, but it is even permissible through the triad MLS uh, to, to as long as the BIC is a member, then you can co-list with any agent. So that's just something to know about their policies and how they work. And then the triangle MLS also permits co-listing uh, with other agents whose BICs are triangle MLS members. All right. And so that lets you know how co-listings are handled, especially if you co-list with an agent that is outside of KW. All right. Number six is coming soon. Now we have seen tons and tons of these 
here lately and in this market because of um, just the volume of transactions with uh, and as how quickly the sales are happening for sellers. So a lot of them are opting to start their advertising early before the listing goes live with a coming soon. So our policy on coming soon is if any of the properties are to be listed with coming soon status, the agent must make sure that the proper forms are signed by the seller, that agent, and the BIC, and they have to be uploaded into the MLS. Keep in mind, you have to follow the rule of your uh, specific MLS that you're subscribed to. And so when it comes to the coming soon, there are different forms for the triad MLS and for the triangle MLS. So you have to use the correct form and you have to upload it in the listing to make sure that you have the proper paperwork in place to do a coming soon ad, okay? Uh, the triangle MLS will permit you to be coming soon for uh, 30 days. So as, from the day that you put it in, you, you're permitted to be in a coming soon status for up to 30 days before it has to go active. The triad permits coming soon for 21 days and you have to put the date that your client intends for the listing to go active in that form. So there are different forms, different rules. Make sure that you're familiar with the, the rules of the MLS that you will be listing the property in. If you're a member of multiple MLSs, our general company policy there is that we want you to list in all of the MLSs unless you specifically ask for BIC permission to with, withdraw it or keep it out of one of the MLSs. And so each MLS has rules about where the properties are located, certain counties uh, that require the listings. And so we just want to make sure that you're in compliance if you choose not to list in all three, uh, but you're a member of all three, we want to make sure that you're in compliance before we give that permission to keep it out of one of the MLSs. Most frequently, if you're listing a property that's in the triangle MLS area, we have agents sometimes that don't want to put it in the Alamance MLS. And so we will approve that because if it's in the one of the triangle MLS counties, Alamance only requires listings that are in Alamance County. So we just wanna make sure again that you're compliant so that you don't get any dings or any fines from these MLSs because they love to ding you and fine you. Um, so we want to help you to avoid that. Any questions so far? We've covered the first six, six out of 30. We've got quite a few more to go. Any questions on advertising, agent on duty, co-listing, or coming soon? All right. If we don't have any questions, then we will continue to move forward. And so um, the next policy and procedure that we have here is number seven on commercial sales. Now, commercial sales, and I've gotten quite a few calls about this, so I wanted to make sure um, that we spent the time and discussed how uh, our market center is going to operate concerning commercial sales. All right. And so this is the policy. All commercial listings must be listed by a participant of the KW Commercial Division. So that's how we're handling our commercial listings. Any agent that is not a participant of KW Commercial Division that has a potential listing must co-list with an agent who is a member of the commercial group or refer that listing to the commercial division. Okay, there's just so much uh, separation between residential and commercial that if you are not a commercial agent and a part of our commercial division, it is better for you to either refer that listing or co-list with an agent who is, okay? So commercial deals require uh, extensive commercial knowledge. And so that's our policy to either refer it or co-list with a commercial agent. Any agent wishing to assist buyers in commercial purchases must co-broke that transaction with a KW commercial agent or refer that buyer to a KW commercial agent. So same policy, whether it's listings or buyers. All agents desiring involvement in commercial transactions 
are subject to the educational requirements established by KWRI and our market center leadership. So if you want to get involved in commercial real estate, we welcome that, but we do require a certain amount of education and that, we, that you join our commercial division so that you can properly and carefully protect our commercial clients. Any questions about that? Anybody in here thinking about commercial? Well, if you do or choose no. to. Oh, yeah. Jeff, no. you're thinking about it? Oh, no. you said no. <laughs> Referral, I'll refer it. <laughs> You'll refer it out. Okay. Uh, I think that's a wise idea, uh, Jeff. And so, again, we have the policy in place just to guide you. Um, if you get an opportunity for commercial so that you'll know the proper way to handle that transaction. All right, number eight. Number eight is our computer usage policy. Now, this one is largely uh, mirrors the KWRI international policy. So that's why it's a bit lengthy uh, and it has quite a few details here about uh, computer usage. And so generally, we're not going to go line by line through this one because it's quite lengthy, uh, but the, the main that we want you to know about computer usage is that the business computers should be used for business purposes. And so we do have um, some restrictions here when it comes to internet usage, using it, using it properly, careful about your surfing if there's someone who wants to use a company computer for business and you're using it for recreation, we ask you to, uh, you know, allow them to use the computer so that they can actually conduct their business. Um, you can't browse any websites that are inappropriate content, including racial, ethnic, or hate content, or violent or sexually explicit content. So th our company computer should not be used for any of those types of um, inappropriate content. All right. Um, and so when it comes to the computer usage policy, the number one is that computers provided by the company and the offices are for business use. Non-KW associates and children are not allowed to use the company computers. Okay. So they are for designed for business use and for KW agents only. All right. Agents and employees may use a company computer for personal internet browsing if no one else in the office needs to use it for business purposes. Again, making sure that you avoid the inappropriate content there. Any personal data or files that you have should not be stored on our company computers. So if you have personal data or files, you need to... Uh, send them to a Google Drive or keep them in your own email. Do not save those to the company computers. All right. And so we're going to keep here. Let me move this over just a second. All right. So from the computer usage policy, again, um, internet usage primarily focused around not using it inappropriately. Uh, number five is the email usage. If an agent or employee maintains email on the company computers, they're not considered private or confidential. So that's important for you to know. If you're using email files and they're on company computers, then uh, they are able to be reviewed by the company management at the company's discretion. Okay, so just be aware that uh, we might have a need to review uh, any information that you might have used on the company's computer if you have a uh, company email. Uh, you will provide at the request of the company copies of any email communications you possess regarding any client, customer, or transaction involving the company or its sales associates. That policy usually comes into play if we have a, a scenario where there is a complaint. Um, if we receive a letter from the Real Estate Commission and we need to dig into the details of the transaction, then we, we, we will likely request that you send us all of the communications that you have regarding that transaction. 
Uh, if a case may need to go to the errors and omissions insurance, we would likely need to provide that information to the e &O attorneys as well. All right. Agents and employees may not defame any person in any email communication. So keep your emails, again, about properties, not about people. Again, just a general rule of wisdom there. Agents and employees may not use inappropriate language in any email communication. We've already talked about what that inappropriate language or activity would be. Agents and employees will be solely responsible for any contracts obligating them entered into via email communication. If the company becomes liable for a contract made by an agent or employee in an email communication, the agent or employee will promptly reimburse the company for the costs of the contract and or the company will have the right to deduct those costs from any pending commission due to the agent or salary, uh, or any co pending commission or salary due to that employee. All right, and then the last one, all email communications must conform to state and federal laws. So make sure you know the laws like the can spam law that you have to have an opt out message if you're sending out mass emails in case someone does not wish to receive them. Number six, any communications transmitted or communication methods used via company computer must be appropriate within all applicable local, state, federal laws. You cannot use them. And this is really a lot of repetition, but again, we copied this section primarily from the KWRI and they really want you not to use company computers inappropriately. All right, number seven, you must obey applicable laws and regulations in your business and personal use of the computer, email, social media, internet browsing. And these applicable areas of law include copyright and trademark as well as defamation of character, libel, slander, fraud, and misrepresentation. So watch out and, and avoid inappropriately using uh, the computers for any of these types of activities. Preferably avoid these activities at all, uh, but certainly don't use company computers if you decide to do so. All right. Number eight talks about privacy. So because the, the, the actual computers and communication communication systems, including the network systems are company owned, all material communications, information and usage may be monitored and regulated by the company in any way that the company deems necessary and appropriate. All right, so just always be aware that if we deem it necessary that we can um, uh, review any communications that are needed. Uh, no agent or employee shall retain or maintain any rights to information or communication stored or routed through company computers, and no agent or employee shall have any privacy rights regarding any information that is accessed or created, communicated, transmitted, or any activity conducted using company computers. So regardless of the re reason for your use, there's no privacy rights for use of company computers. A question. Yes, sir. Are the Gmail KW emails considered uh, KW property? Okay, that is an excellent question. So they are Gmail accounts, but if they have KW in the name, then they are considered to be KW property. So when it comes to uh, the, the Gmail account usage, if you have, if you use KW or any form of Keller Williams, then that is considered to be KW property. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Number nine, conflict resolution. All right. So ideally, everyone would all act like good little boys and girls or, uh, and be nice to one another. But occasionally, the rare, rare occasion that you might have a conflict, we have some uh, guidelines on how to resolve this conflict, okay? So we want you to uh, operate according to our KW belief system, the W. I4C2TES. And we're going to talk about what that is and what it looks like and how to use that in conflict resolution. 
Okay, so this is when conflict arises in a transaction, whether it's between the agent and a client or an agent to agent also. You should contact, if it's in a transaction, you should contact your broker in charge for assistance. But if conflict arises between agents, then follow these procedures below, okay? So if you have a conflict with a client, do contact your broker in charge. All right, so this is what the WI4C2TES is. Win-win uh, or no deal. So try to operate under coming to some sort of an agreement that is a win-win uh, for everyone that is involved in the conflict, okay? Integrity, meaning do the right thing. So whatever the conflict is, you want to pursue doing the right thing to come to uh, a resolution, okay? The four Cs are customers always come first, commitment in all things, communication, seek first to understand, and then creativity, ideas before results. So if you operate with these four Cs, before you jump to a conclusion, really communicate and seek to understand what the other person is trying to convey, you may be able to use your creativity and come up with ideas to get to a resolution of the conflict. A lot of time when it comes to conflict, it is uh, because proper communication was not actually created between the parties and there was some sort of misunderstanding. Okay, so seek first to understand that will generally help with a, a satisfactory resolution when it comes to conflict. All right, the two T's are teamwork and trust. So teamwork together, everyone achieves more. That actually, if you use it as an acronym, it's T-E-A-M, teamwork. Uh, so we want to work together uh, so that we can all uh, grow together and achieve more. And trust starts with honesty. So start with being honest in whatever situation, whatever conflict, so that you can develop the trust to come to uh, an agreement and a resolution. And then finally, the E and the S, equity. So we want opportunities for all, for every person, every agent, every client, equal equality, equity, and success results through people. All right. So you want to have results and you're going to have to get those results by figuring out how to uh, work with and how to um, come to some sort of agreement with people. Arturo, did you have a question? Okay. Um, sorry, so sorry. When it, oh yeah, no worries. Okay. So the goal here is uh, to remain in culture with our fellow associates, even if there's a conflict. Um, if you do have a challenge or problem, then you want to seek staff leadership or guidance if you're not able to come to um, that solution on your own or with your own efforts. But we want you all to use the uh, Keller Williams belief system and try to uh, equitably work out the scenario yourselves before getting leadership involved. But if you need to, you can certainly follow these following steps below. All right. So number one, and look for guidance for a conflict. You want to make sure that you can clearly define the problem. So you want to really think about what the issue is and try to even uh, identify any underlying issue. Okay. Number two, come together and communicate. So allow the other party to also be heard and understood without interruption. So not just one person coming, but come together to the staff to work towards a conflict resolution. Uh, establish relationships and again, building open, honest communication through both respect and honesty so that we can build trust. Number four, develop an action plan. After the issues have been defined and the grievances have been communicated, then we want to have a reasonable solution over um, what to do next. So each party should walk away with next steps so that they can avoid uh, having the same issue to, to come again. Number five, get commitment. Once there's a mutual and agreed upon solution, 
then there needs to be follow through on those takeaway uh, actions that are given to all the parties that are involved. And number six, provide feedback. So establish a follow-up meeting where both parties will get back together and measure the results of the action plan that was developed to resolve the conflict. Okay, so these are the steps that we would like to follow should you decide to get leadership involved in uh, conflict resolution. All right, any questions about that? In an ideal world, there would not be conflict, but this is far from an ideal world. So uh, if you run into conflict, we have some guidelines on things to think about, how to deal with it, how to address it, but also some steps to take if you would like or need to get leadership involved. All right, so that is number nine. Number 10, cooperating with real estate firms that are not members of the MLS. So you know that uh, agents do not have to be members of the MLS to um, assist a buyer with buying property. And so if the buyer's agent is not a member of the MLS where the property is advertised, a separate cooperation agreement must be made prior to the offer being submitted. So this is how we're going to, uh, this is our company policy. So they have to first submit their cooperation agreement. And then after that has been addressed and signed, then they should submit the offer. Okay. KW Central does agree to compensate all buyer agents the same as the advertised commission in the MLS. KW Central does not offer any compensation to seller sub agents. So if there is an agent, they do have to have an actual buyer agency agreement in order to receive the same advertised commission as what's in the MLS. Any questions about that? Well, good. All right, number 11. So you all should understand as agents, you got your license, so you had to pass the test, right? You all should understand what designated agency is, what dual agency is, and our company does practice dual designated agency. And so in order to practice it, we have to have a written policy, and this is our dual designated agency policy, okay? So this is how it works for uh, for our Burlington, or no, KW Central now. I, I have to get used to our new name. So this is how KW Central is handling our dual designated agency. When dual agency arises with another agent in our entire market center, so, so that does mean any of the three locations, because again, we're one market center. So even if you primarily work in Mebane, if you have a buyer for a property that an agent in Burlington has listed, we are under dual agency, okay? So that's something that we're really trying to help all of our agents understand. Regardless of which office you primarily function out of, all of us are one market center and all of our clients then would potentially have the opportunity for dual agency to arise if any agent from any of these office locations has a client that needs to uh, be involved in a transaction with another, all right? And so when dual agency arises with another agent in our entire market center and either the buyer or seller has opted for dual designated agency, then the opposing agent will have to practice dual designated agency also. So remember, they have to approve it in order for you to offer it. But if they have, then we both have to practice dual designated agency. And by the way, what that is, is that's the, the type of agency that allows you to advocate for your client. So that's the best kind of dual agency because you can uh, continue to almost exclusively represent your client in this dual designated agency role, okay? The agency agreement will have to be amended and initialed by the client to make sure that all parties have appropriately agreed to dual designated agency. And this is only possible if no personal or confidential information about your client has been disclosed to the other agent. If personal and confidential information has been shared that will directly affect the negotiations, 
then the dual designated agency cannot be practiced between those two agents, okay? And so in that case, there can still be dual designated agency, but we have two options available here, okay? Option number one is to have both clients agree in writing to amend their agency agreements to simply dual agency. But the, the thing is that will change to no negotiation uh, from either agent, no advocacy and no sharing of confidential information so that they can continue to work with their specific agents. So if there is that personal confidential information that has been passed between, then they have to go backtrack into a dual agency or the agents have to notify their team leader in BIC and a new agent who has not received the personal and confidential information about the other side can be assigned if they want to continue in the dual and designated agency. So if they want the advocacy, if they want assistance with negotiation, then another agent will have to be assigned. The original agent will receive a referral commission according to the work that they performed up to that point. And the clients must be notified of the designation of the new agent in order to continue that transaction to closing. All right, so these are the two things that can happen if dual and designated agency arises, but one of the agents knows something personal or confidential about the other side. Any questions so far? That tends to be a pretty complicated topic. All right, well, moving on. So from here, any agent in dual designated agency with the seller who is presented with the opportunity to represent the buyer must refer the buyer to another agent or have the big designate an agent. All right, I will read this one to you again. This is really key. We probably should put that one in bold. An agent that is in dual designated agency with the seller who is presented with the opportunity to represent the buyer must refer that buyer to another agent or have the BIC designate an agent. Okay, so it's saying that you cannot perform dual designated agency for your seller and represent the buyer. You can't be designated for both. And so in that case, if you have designated agency with your seller, you must refer the buyer to another agent or have the BIC designate one for the buyer. All right, number 12, e &O policy. Now this one's important. You do have e &O insurance when you join our firm. It's a part of your monthly dues that you pay um, to be an agent here. But this is what the e &O policy actually entails. And a lot of agents are not familiar with the details. So let's go over this one together uh, in detail here. Uh, the e &O policy. Agent will receive the e &O insurance as a part of their monthly fees of KW Central. If any official complaint comes from the commission, if an agent is being threatened by a client or an attorney or another firm, or if the agent is aware of a problem that could become a potential issue, the head broker or BIC must be notified immediately. In order to make sure that the insurance company is aware of any potential claims. Okay. So if you know of anything that, that might turn into a pretty significant uh, or potential lawsuit or issue, you need to notify the BIC immediately. And we have to immediately notify ENO. It's too late to notify them if a lawsuit has already been filed and we knew it could be coming, but we didn't take action. So it's important that you make us aware, even if there's just the potential of the opportunity for a claim, okay? If the agent fails to notify the head broker and BIC immediately, the insurance company can decide to deny a future claim. So you all have a big part in the potential. If there's something that might turn into a potential claim, you must notify us immediately or your claim may be denied, okay? Now, if an e &O claim is filed and accepted, the agent will be responsible for a deductible. And this is how the deductibles work. 
If your claim is up to $5,000, you will be responsible for a deductible up to $2,500. So essentially, you will be responsible for half of the claim up to $5,000. So if it turns out that there is a claim and that there has to be a payout for $4,000, then you would be responsible for $2,000 of that claim. All right, so it's important that you are aware of and you understand that. For claims that are greater than $5,000, the agent will be responsible for a deductible of up to $5,000. So if there is a major claim that ends up costing potentially tens or 20 or beyond that thousands of dollars, uh, the maximum deductible that you would pay individually is $5,000. Okay, now these amounts are subject to change upon annual review. So depending on um, how many E&O claims we get as a, as a company, uh, depending on how many E&O claims you get individually as an agent, um, then they may cause these policies to potentially change. So that has to be renewed annually for the firm, and we have to review it annually based on the number of claims that, that the firm experienced that year. All right, there were several claims last year. You guys may not be aware of uh, the number of, um, of uh, transactions that end up in e &O, uh, claims. All right, uh, number 13 is the exit policy. We do have a policy for exiting the company properly. All right. Now, life happens, people's goals and, and situations change, and we understand that. And so if you decide for any reason that you need to leave the market center, or if you choose to transfer to another company, then you will need to follow these guidelines. There's just three steps here that are listed in how to appropriately exit the company. Okay. The first one is step number one, to meet with the team leader and complete an exit interview and a survey. That's the first step. So that's who you should notify first if you've decided that you're going to leave the market center. Your second step is that you're gonna to need to meet with the MCA to settle any of the unpaid bills, any outstanding bills, uh, and make sure that the finances are in order and prepare for your departure. And then the third step is that you need to meet with the BIC so that you can have termination forms and any transfer forms signed if you're taking any listings with you or any clients. So we need to address uh, any of those type of scenarios or uh, transfer of any listings. If you have listings that are already under uh, contract and on their way to closing, we need to determine how to handle uh, those, any um, transactions that are in progress. And so that last and final meeting with the BIC is important to make sure that anything that needs to be transferred or closed out happens uh, regardless of when you actually exit the company. So we will determine how to handle those and make sure that everything is handled uh, appropriately and that you get your compensation. All right, so that's our exit policy. Uh, you, you will need to have three meetings, the team leader, the MCA, and the BIC. Number 14 is our policy for expired and withdrawn listings. Now, certainly you've probably attended plenty of trainings that told you that these are really great lead opportunities. Uh, if a listing has expired, that is evidence that the sellers at one point wanted to sell and they listed, but they were not successful for some reason. So that would be a really good um, potential lead to follow up on. And same thing with withdrawn listings. So we have a policy on how to handle those, especially if the expired or the withdrawn listing is from one of our own agents. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about here in number 14. But before we do, I am going to give you all a, uh, a 10 minute break. I'm used to doing that because I'm also an instructor approved with the Real Estate Commission and apparently Adults can only sit still for about 50 minutes at a time. So let's take a 10 minute break, uh, you know, go handle whatever business you need. We'll come back together at 1105 and we'll keep moving forward through the remainder of the policies. All right. So take 10 minutes. Thank you.
You're welcome. I'll see you at 1105.
All right, well, welcome back. I hope that you all had a nice little break there. I was trying to get caught up on some voicemails. I don't know about you guys, but like the phone never rings until you're in the middle of a meeting or something, right? So anywho, uh, we are gonna keep moving forward for number 14. This is where we left off, expireds and the withdrawn listing policy. So when a listing needs to be withdrawn before the expiration of the agreement, I just had to help the agent with this yesterday, uh, the termination of the agency agreement must be provided to the BIC immediately with the request to withdraw the listing and the MLS that it needs to be withdrawn from. Most MLSs require any withdrawn listings to be done by the broker in charge. So if you try to go in and withdraw it yourself, you're going to run into uh, some issues with the MLS. Um, and so if you do have a listing that needs to be withdrawn, you have to send it to the uh, actual termination of agency agreements in the form to broker in charge 832 at gmail.com with the request of which MLSs that the listing needs to be withdrawn from, okay? Triangle and triad rules require the listing to be withdrawn by the BIC. Alamance does allow the agent to withdraw the listing themselves as long as the BIC has that termination form, okay? Uh, when it comes to triangle and triad, they require us to actually upload the termination form. And so that's why they required the BIC to terminate those listings. Okay, now that's for one that is actually going to be terminated or withdrawn. When a listing is approaching expiration, if the agent wants to extend the listing, the renewal agreement has to be signed and submitted into command two days before that listing is due to expire. Okay, so you have to handle this. You can't wait till the last day. Our company policy is that you address the soon to expire listing if you're going to renew it uh, two days prior to expiration. Okay. In addition to that, you have to either go to, for triangle MLS, you have to go and upload that renewal and extension into the MLS before it expires, or they will require a brand new listing agreement. So if you don't want to start all over again with the 13 page listing agreement, then you go ahead and get that one page renewal signed and uploaded in the MLS before it expires. They do not give you any leeway after expiration to try to reopen that listing. Okay. Now for triad and elements, you'd simply go in and change the expiration date of the listing before it expires. Now you still have to have your form, but you don't have to upload it into either of those two MLSs, but you do have to change the date before it expires. Once it expires, there's no reopening of the listing. You have to start all over again with a brand new listing. Okay, so it's important for you to handle your soon to expire listings. I know that that sounds really strange in this market because most listings are probably jumping off the market day zero or day three. Um, but if you have a listing that is going to expire, um, handle the expiration at minimum two days before expiration if you're going to renew it. And if you have one that needs to be withdrawn prior to the end of the agency agreement, don't forget to get that termination to the broker in charge email with the request to remove it from the appropriate MLSs. Number 15 talks about compensation. This one should be a particular I, I got a question. Sorry. Yes, sir. So, so we're just making a request to have it removed. We and then once the request is approved, we remove it, or does a request initiate the broken charge to remove it? Okay. Who who does the removing? It depends on which MLS. So if it's triangle or triad, the broker in charge has to remove it. Okay. All right. If it's Alamance, then you can remove it yourself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I guess I should read along with you. I was just I... listening. To... <laughs> Thank you. You have access to these. Uh, we showed you where to find them if you want to go back and read later. But yeah, so that's, you know, we do have it here for reference. There, I know that I'm throwing so much information at you guys, so I don't expect you to catch every detail. So that's why we got it here for you in writing when you need to refer back to it. Number 15, the firm's compensation. 
KW prefers to receive at least 6% commission on the resale of residential property, at least 5% commission on new construction, at least 10% commission on a commercial transaction, and between 6 to 10% on vacant land. Okay, so these are the guidelines that we're providing to you on what kind of commission structure that you should negotiate between yourself and your client on KW's behalf. Because remember, you're actually signing them to uh, the firm, okay? Now, any decreased deviation to these guidelines of more than 1% must be approved by leadership. If you have a client who has a residential property and uh, you're asking for 6% and they want you to do it at four and a half, you can't just agree to do it at four and a half. You have to actually speak to leadership about the, the situation, why they're asking for such a low percentage and what the leadership um, either approves or does not approve concerning how much they're asking to reduce it. So if they're asking for more than 1%, you must have approval from the leadership before you agree to that amount, okay? It is your business, but we want to assist you in getting what you're worth. And so, that, so we're not gonna just let you give away tons of commission without a really uh, in-depth discussion about why they're asking for such a significant reduction. All right, and so we'll give you some thoughts and some ideas or some um, responses to go back to. In most cases, we may approve it, but depending on what the situation is or how difficult that client is, we may not for your benefit, but we'll talk about it. That's why it needs to be a discussion uh, with leadership. If, if it's a significant, meaning more than 1% decrease in uh, the commission. Now, another thing that you need to know is that for small transactions, so these are like if you're assisting someone maybe with uh, uh, finding a rental property or if it's maybe a really small vacant lot that doesn't have a lot of commission. So small transactions uh, and agents who assist tenants in obtaining a rental property who receive $300 or less in compensation will not be subject to the $75 transaction fee or or the company dollar split. So if the transaction is 300 or less, you do not have to pay a transaction fee on that or do the company dollar split. <clears throat> but all transactions are subject to the 6% royalty until the agent is capped on royalty. So there will be a small royalty that would come out even of a small transaction, but not the transaction fee or company dollar. All right, so that's important for you to know so that if you help uh, someone to find a rental property. Now, remember, KW, we don't do property management, or at least our firm, our division doesn't. And so if you were to help someone, it would just be helping someone to find a property to rent. All right. Number 16 talks about group and team policies and procedures. So you all have, I'm sure there's tons of teams out there. So you all have heard of this term, a team um, and there are some other terms that you may or may not be familiar with. So we're going to spend a little bit of time here defining what a group is, what a team is, and then what an individual is or is considered to be per KW uh, central policies and procedures. Okay, so we're going to dig in deep here. So get ready. Number 16, due to federal antitrust laws, KW International does not establish any guidelines to be followed with determining commission structure. And remember, the Real Estate Commission doesn't either. And so it's up to our firm to establish our own firm's guidelines, okay? So when we're talking about teams, we've got husband and wife teams, there are other teams or groups of sales associates that come together um, and compare to individual sales associates. So the market center will establish guidelines for business and operation policies. Below will define the criteria that will qualify a team or a group within KW Central. Teams and groups may position their production so that one of them can receive profit sharing on the total combined production. Uh, and you should see the MCA for any details about starting your team. 
Now, when you're in dual agency, the firm policy is to keep all clients' personal and confidential information confidential, even from other agents, okay? So that's something when we're talking about teams, if we find ourselves in just dual and not designated, then you must keep the client's information confidential, even from other agents, okay? So keep that in mind if you're in dual agency in a team setting or scenario. So what is a team? What is a group? And what is an individual per our market center? So this is what it looks like. A group is going to be considered to be three or more active producing associates who wish to total their production together. There must be a mega agent who has a minimum annual production of six million, employ a full-time assistant and a buyer's agent, and their buyer agent has to pay a half cap, okay? As group production increases by 2 million in closed volume, they qualify to add another buyer agent or a listing specialist at another half cap. These additional agents must come from outside of the KW office to qualify for the half cap. If the fellow KW agent joins the team, they would remain at full cap for the first year on the team. And then from there, they can switch to a half cap, okay? So this is considered to be a group. So this is the rules for a group. There must be a mega agent in the group already at annual 6 million production. And then the team, every time it increases by 2 million, they could add on another uh, agent or listing specialist at a half cap. Okay, now a team defined for KW Central would be two active agents who combine their production, but each of them will continue to pay a full cap and royalty each, as well as form a legal entity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So your team must have their entity, an LLC or partnership that has no minimum production. The team can have an unlicensed assistant and if two active agents are married, their cap is going to be adjusted to a joint full cap, but each one of them will continue to pay their royalty if they file their income taxes separately. If they file jointly, then they can have a shared royalty as well, okay? So this is for either husband and wife teams or for teams that are just two agents that choose to uh, create a legal entity and practice together. Again, they, use, they still will both pay their own full cap and royalty, all right? And then the third one is the individual. And this may be um, most of you <clears throat> at some point in your career <clears throat> will fall under this individual one here. Excuse me for just a second. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so the individual is the associate who works as an actively licensed individual producing agent. You may have one or more assistants who handle clerical administrative or service functions that do not require a real estate license. If one or more assistants have a license, <clears throat> excuse me, but they do not show property or sign contracts or negotiate or solicit any business, then the associate may still be considered to be an individual agent, okay? So here we are saying that your individual, as long as you either have an unlicensed assistant or even a licensed one that's not actively using their license. So they're not doing functions that require a real estate license. If that's the case, then you can remain an individual agent. All right, so that is the definition of these three groups or uh, scenarios here, group and team policies within KW Central. And again, you can look back and review these a little more slowly to get uh, on your own time, especially if you're thinking about uh, operating with other agents in a team or a group setting. All right, number 17. So now we are going to shift and talk about harassment. Now, again, just like we did with the computer policy, 
A lot of our harassment policy has been lifted from the KWRI um, policy, but there's a few things that are in addition or in KWRI that we're going to refer to at the bottom of this section. <clears throat> in general, uh, harassment is not permitted, it's not tolerated, it's not condoned by KW. And so we are going to um, review the content here, but we are going to, uh, we're not going to go line by line through the entire harassment section here. Okay, so any harassment of an associate, whether it's an agent, an employee, an applicant, um, because of race, color, sex, religion, national origin, age, military status, or handicap is clearly prohibited and will not be condoned. Um, sexual harassment is one particular form of discrimination which is illegal and violates our company's longstanding equal employment opportunity policy. KW Central maintains a strong policy prohibiting any form of sexual harassment. No agent employee, staff member, customer, or vendor may sexually harass an employee, agent, or other person asso associated with the company by any of these uh, actions or activities. And so let's review what we define here as sexual harassment that is not permitted or allowed. Number one, making unwelcome sexual advances or requests for sexual favors or other verbal or physical conduct of a sexually suggestive nature. Or number two, making submission to or rejection of conduct basis for employment, continued employment, or any other employment decision affecting the employee. Or number three, creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment by such conduct. Okay, so there's just no place for any kind of inappropriate sexual behavior, sexual harassment uh, in this workplace. Any agent or employee who has been found to have sexually harassed another agent or employee will be subject to appropriate discipline, including discharge from association or employment. This policy applies equally to any work-related sexual harassment by or to anyone employed by or associated with the company or who deal with the company in our business. It's not limited to supervisor or employee or manager versus agent relations or to conduct occurring on the premises or during work hours. Any agent or employee who believes that he or she is being or has been sexually harassed by another agent should promptly take one of the following, one or more of the following steps. So these are the steps you should take if you believe that you have or are being sexually harassed. If appropriate, discuss the situation directly with the person who you feel is harassing you. So we do, if appropriate, ask you to ask them politely to cease the harassment because you do not feel like you're welcoming their conduct. Uh, you might add that if they don't cease altogether, you will take further steps. If the person is a customer or client, please refer your complaint to the broker in charge, and we will get involved with um, how to address that behavior with your customer or client. Number two, if you believe that some adverse employment consequence may result from your discussion with that person, or if the harassment continues, go to your BIC who will report it to the team leader and the OP. You'll be required to state in writing specific details about the harassing behavior, including date, time, place, and if there are any witnesses, okay? An investigation will be undertaken immediately and all complaints will be handled promptly in a confidential manner as much as the investigation will permit, okay? So there will be no adverse action directed towards any agent who submits a complaint regarding sexual harassment uh, or for making that complaint unless it was clearly in bad faith. So if you're falsely accusing someone, then there will be action taken against you for that false accusation, okay? There are uh, three other policies. Again, we're not gonna cover all these in detail, but you are welcome to go to the KWRI policy 4.9.4.14 4, and 15. And these two policies also apply concerning sexual harassment. 
All right. So in general, it's never appropriate. It is not welcome. You are not permitted to sexually harass anyone uh, in the workplace. You shouldn't do it at all. Uh, number 18, heritage title, affiliated business policy. You all should be familiar that we are required for all buyer clients to have them to sign the affiliated business arrangement disclosure form. Okay. You're not required to have uh, seller clients sign them. So it's for buyer clients. They do not have to use heritage title, but they have the option. And there's a separate form if they would like to actually select and use heritage title. And so that's what this section here is talking about. So the two forms are the affiliated business arrangement disclosure form. It is required and must be signed at the time that the buyer enters the written buyer agency agreement. The second form, the Keller Williams title, Realty Title Insurance Selection Form, is to be used at the time of the contract if the buyer selects to use heritage title. Both of these forms are located in DocuSign, and you can co contact the Director of Communication if you need those forms. Any questions so far? I know there's a lot of policies and procedures, and at least you get to go through them one time in detail uh, as you are about to go on your way and embark on your real estate careers. All right, number 19 talks about money handling. Now, this one's also important. How to handle the due diligence funds or the earnest money or any closing funds once you have them in your possession, okay? So agents must promptly deliver any funds in their possession to the seller if it's due diligence, or the escrow agent if it is earnest money. When the funds are paid electronically, then you need to ask your client for some sort of proof of the electronic uh, transfer. You can ask for a receipt, um, a screenshot if necessary to prove that the transfer has taken place so that you can enter that into command for compliance because you do have a compliance uh, item where you have proof of transfer of the uh, funds related to the transaction. Now, upon closing, the agents will bring their commission checks to any market center office, and the checks will be couriered daily to Burlington. If the checks are received by the MCA by 9 a.m., the payments will be dispersed by 5 p.m. If the file is compliant and approved in command. So again, you gotta make sure that all of the required documents are in command before your funds will be dispersed, okay? So it's up to you to make sure that your files are in order. Um, the agents have the option of the ACH deposit or a paper check. You will contact the MCA to set your preference when it comes to how you're gonna receive your compensation. Number 20 is the multiple offer policy. All right, now, this policy is um, designed to help you to know how to properly handle uh, multiple offers, especially if you run into uh, scenarios of potentially dual or even designated dual agency and multiple offers. And so this one can get a little bit complicated. I'm gonna actually slow down as we go through this one. This is the last long policy. After this one, um, the rest of them are pretty short and sweet. And so, well, the safety has a little bit of link to it too. But we're gonna slow down and make sure that it's pretty clear as we're covering this particular policy with you. So the multiple officer offer policy, you will use this guideline when you're dealing with multiple offers on a KW listing. And so that would certainly apply, especially in uh, this market. All right. So A, all offers must be presented to the seller up to the time of a completed closing. So don't forget that the Real Estate Commission requires you as agents to present all offers to the client, regardless of the status of the transaction. Even if you're under contract, if offers continue to come in, you must present them all the way until the closing, okay? So it's important for you to understand that. 
Multiple offers should be presented at the same time unless directed otherwise by the seller. Every offer received should be put on equal footing in terms of being presented fairly to the seller. The seller can choose to respond to one of them, some of them, or all of them at their sole discretion. Okay, so remember, you, you are there to assist and to advise, but you must follow your seller's lawful instruction. You cannot make the decision on behalf of your seller. Okay, never untruthfully indicate the existence of multiple offers to heighten the sense of urgency of the prospective buyer. So you may only disclose that there's multiple offers with your seller's permission and if there actually are multiple offers, okay? You cannot lie and say that there are if there is not. Uh, for B, when receiving multiple offers on the same property, it's our policy that you first carefully discuss with the seller before providing any information to the buyer's agent or the buyer about the fact that there being multiple offers offers. Records of notification of multiple offer spreadsheets must be uploaded in command, okay? So you do have to record that you are notifying all of the agents of multiple offers if your seller has given you permission to do so. And those are records that are required to be uploaded. C, if a seller desires to simply accept one of the offers received or to respond or negotiate with only one or a few of the multiple offer offerors, that is their right. This negotiation can proceed with several offerors without informing any of them that there are multiple offers. And this is how the seller wants to proceed. You may advise the seller, but must follow their directive and under no circumstances should multiple counter offers be signed by the seller and delivered to buyers. This could put the seller in the position of multiple contracts for the same property. So keep in mind, you have to follow that seller's instruction. They may not want to notify any of them that there are multiple offers and they may want to conduct negotiations with different ones at the same time, as long as they don't send multiple signed counter offers. Okay, so it's important for you to follow your seller's instructions. D, when the listing agent is acting as a dual agent, because of multiple offer, one of the multiple offers is from a Keller Williams associate, the firm has the obligation to inform its buyer client and therefore all buyer agents and buyers of the multiple offer situation. So in the case of dual agency, we have the obligation of informing the buyers of multiple offer situation. So it's important that you let the seller know that if any of the offers come from an agent of our firm. E, where multiple offers are received and the listing agent has procured one of the offers, unless it's from an unrepresented uh, buyer, the following applies. Okay, so this is the one where it gets a little bit complicated. Number one, if it's from a group or a team, if the listing agent is a part of a group or team and a buyer seeking representation wants to write an offer, the listing agent will pass the buyer to the group or team's buyer representative, okay? If it's individual, if the listing agent is acting as a dual agent in the transaction, it is our office policy that the offer should be presented to the seller by the broker in charge or their designee to assure fairness. Listing agent must direct all buyer's agents or buyers to send offers to the broker in charge 832 at gmail.com. So if there is an individual that's a listing agent that is also working with the buyer in, in dual agency that has been approved by both the buyer and the seller, then that buyer's offer needs to be presented to the seller by the broker in charge to ensure to assure that there is fairness in the presentation of that specific offer is what we're saying here. Okay, so you may have to get the broker in charge involved if it's an individual agent operating as a dual agent in a multiple offer situation. Okay, keep in mind, all of this is related to if, it, if we're in a scenario of multiple offers. And then finally, F, 
If there are multiple offers and a buyer's agent requests to present the offer for their client to the seller themselves, the listing agent must obtain consent from the seller, okay? So the buyer agent can request it, but the seller has the ultimate decision there. And if they will allow that presentation, then you must allow it. Any questions about that? How to handle multiple offers from our firm's policy? I do recommend, especially in this um, market that we are in, that you do uh, review and go over this policy very carefully uh, before you list a property to make sure that you handle multiple offers correctly. All right, so that was number 20. Number 21, office exclusive listings. Now, when it comes to office exclusive, because of the uh, volatility in this market, there may be some sellers that don't want to be inundated with countless buyers, and they might not want 40 people running through their house in two days, uh, especially with the event of COVID-19 and all the other things that are happening. And so there may be sellers that would prefer an office exclusive. If they do, that means that their listing will be exclusively marketed to our market center only. It will not be entered into the MLS and it won't go public if they are choosing an office exclusive, okay? So uh, what our policy is concerning that Remember that each MLS has their own rules. Our market center does allow office exclusive listings to be advertised within our entire market center only. The listing agents must use the appropriate form for approval and submission to the MLS. This form must be signed by the seller, the listing agent, and the BIC, and immediately provided to the admin assistant to the BIC as MLS rules require submission within 24 hours. To obtain the form, visit your MLS website or call your local MLS for assistance. So if you have a seller that prefers an office exclusive that will not be put on the MLS, there's a form that the MLS requires that they sign and provide within 24 hours of the listing so that their listing will not be submitted to the MLS. So they have to be aware of it, but it will not go into the MLS. It will be exclusively marketed only to our agents, okay? So that's how Office Exclusive works. Number 22 are personal transactions. We get a lot of questions about this from agents. And so it's important to understand how we at KW Central handle personal transactions. Okay, per KWRI, so this is per the international policy, each agent is allowed two property transactions, which the agent has ownership interest in annually, for which the company will not collect company dollar, only royalty. So that means that you can have two transactions per year that you have ownership in without having to pay a company dollar. Okay, so you only have to pay the 6% royalty. You do not have to have a split with the company. Okay, now when it comes to these transactions, you still have to upload your files into command for compliance, and there will still be the $75 transaction fee. Agents are not permitted to sell their homes as for sale by owner. So if you do have a home that you want to sell, you must sell them through the market center but you can have up to two transactions per year where you don't have to split or pay company dollar. Okay, so it's important for you to understand how that works for your own personal transactions. Many of our agents are also investors and they do um, have their own personal transactions. Number 23, privilege license and business ent entity documentation is required. So each agent must provide proof of payment of their privilege license annually to your BIC for the office files. And again, that's brokeringcharge832 at gmail.com. Business entities must provide proof of annual firm license renewal and proof of payment of filing the annual report with the, the SOS, the Secretary of State. 
And so if you are operating as an entity, an LLC, corporation, s -Corp, partnership, then you need to provide proof that you have renewed your firm license because we can't compensate your firm without that proof every year and proof that you have filed your annual report with the Secretary of State. Otherwise, you are not officially a licensed entity that can receive compensation. So it's important that we have this proof either of your privilege license of your individual or of your firm license renewal and your annual report um, in order to continue to compensate an entity. Number 24, property management. KW Central does not do property management and is not a party of any property management agreement. If you're managing property with a different company, KW must be informed. So again, we will allow you to be duly affiliated if you wish to do property management but those property management activities must be with a different firm and we do have to be aware of that. So it's important for you to know that concerning property management. If you help a buyer to locate or a uh, tenant to find a property, that's not considered to be property management. It's when you are assisting the landlord in the management of the property that we do not as a firm involve ourselves in. Number 25, provisional brokers post licensing deadline. So many of you all, if you're in boot camp, you may be provisional. You know that the Real Estate Commission requires you to complete your three post licensing classes within 18 months. Well, our company policy is that all three of those required post licensing classes must be completed within nine months from your start date with KW unless the time frame is shortened due to North Carolina Real Estate Commission requirements. So we're cutting that time in half. Um, it, as a part of our firm, we ask you to go ahead and get those classes completed within nine months uh, to make sure that you have your full education requirements complete um, so that you will be able to operate as a full broker uh, within nine months of starting with KW. All right, number 26, referral fees. Now, when it comes to referral fee, uh, you can receive or refer referrals uh, for a compensation. And so these agreements, they are uh, between 10 to 30% is what the company allows. Of the agent's commission must be in writing and filed in command along with the copy of the W-9. If the arrangement is reciprocal, meaning that you're showing the buyer in one city and the other agent is showing them in your city, then whoever gets the buyer under contract will owe the referral fee at the closing to the other agent. Reciprocal agreements should be specified in the other section under the compensation paragraph of the referral agreement. Okay, so if you're having a buyer who's not sure what area that they wanna look in and they wanna look in in multiple areas, then you can have a reciprocal referral agreement with another buyer agent in a different area and whoever gets the transaction will pay that other buyer agent uh, that referral fee, okay? And again, referral fee, you can negotiate anywhere between 10 to 30% of your commission um, in, in receiving or in giving referrals. Any questions about referral fees? All right, well, we are almost there. We have uh, just about, what, four more left, and we've got about 15 minutes, so we're doing good on time here. So um, let's just keep moving forward. All right, so the next one we have here is number 27, uh, retainer consultation and termination fees. All right. So when it comes to retainer or consultation and termination fees, you may charge these in your transaction. If you do, these fees have to be written to Keller Williams. OK, if they are five hundred dollars or less, there will be no company dollar or transaction fee deducted from these particular fees. The royalty will apply if the agent has not capped. 
Now, if you charge fees higher than 500, so $500 and one cent or higher, then if the agent is not capped, company dollar and royalty plus the transaction fee will apply. The above also applies if there's any earnest money released to a seller that has to be split between the seller and the firm. If it's under 500, there will be no company dollar or transaction fee. If it is over 500, then if the agent is not capped, there will be company dollar royalty and transaction fee. Okay, so this is in the case that you charge any retainer fees if you charge a consultation fee for a buyer who decides not to actually hire you or a termination fee if you have a seller who wants to terminate their listing early. So you can charge any of those fees, but remember they do have to be written to Keller Williams. All right, the next and last long policy that we have, and long just means like half a page or more, uh, is our safety policy. And so for Keller Williams, we want to make sure that you understand that your safety is important to us and we want it to be important to you as well. And so we do have a safety policy that we're going to uh, talk about here in this next several bullet points uh, to make you aware of uh, safety practices and safety resources that are available to you um, so that you can practice real estate and earn money, but to do it safely. Um, unfortunately, we live in a a dangerous time and uh, you, you have to keep your own safety at the forefront and in your mind. All right. And so this next section here, real estate sales agents routinely find themselves in situations where they are alone with clients or customers who they know very little about. The very nature of showing real estate to prospective buyers and tenants who are virtual strangers can make agents, both men and women, susceptible to becoming victims of violent crimes. So KW Central recommends that all agents follow the four ba basic safety practices. And so these four practices we're about to cover here. Number one, we recommend that you identify the person that you're working with before you ever meet them in person or alone in a car or a house. Preferably meet them at the office, make a copy of their driver's license, make sure that someone from the office knows where you're going with this person. Number two, always carry your cell phone with you and make sure it's fully charged, it has reception, make sure you have 911 programmed into speed dial or you know how to use that uh, function on your phone. I hear that some iPhones, if you, if you push the button five times, it'll automatically dial for you or something to that effect. So make sure you're familiar with how to use your home, I mean, your phones in order to um, reach 911 or get to uh, call for help in some manner or some fashion. There are several apps out there that you could potentially use to do a quick or one button push to make calls to um, get assistance, okay? Number three, trust your instincts. If you have a bad feeling, don't second guess what it's telling you. Listen to your gut feeling and protect yourself. And then number four, arrange a distress signal with another agent, a family member, a friend, or someone that you trust. Make sure that someone knows where you're going and when you should be back so they can sound the alarm if you don't show up when you are expected, okay? There are many more safety tips and guides uh, that are available to you. And so you can consult the Real Estate Agent Safety Guide. It's a publication from the Association of Realtors and the Real Estate Commission. You can download it from the members only section of the Realtors website, ncrealtors.org, or from the Real Estate Commission's website, ncrec.gov. Okay. In addition to that safety guide, there's many other resources and technology available to assist you with agent safety. The National Association of Realtors has several safety apps on their website. Some of those include uh, an app called Forewarn. There's a Lifeline Response. There's one called People Smart. There's one called Protect. And there's one called Safe Showings. And there are several others that are listed on their 
uh, website. And so you can look into these apps to find out if one of these might fit with your uh, preferences for safety. And then lastly, if you're a member of the Triad MLS, there's an app available called Real Safe Agent that you can download and you can use that app for additional safety resources. Okay, so the MLSs might have uh, additional resources. The Real Safe Agent app is a, a really neat app that uh, anyone who's a member of it, you could push a button and it would notify all the other agents that are members um, that there might be a need for uh, help or alert in the area. Um, and then there are some safety features that are a part of showing time if you are a member of the Triangle MLS as well. All right, so make sure that you keep safety in mind and you don't take your safety for granted. All right, we have two more policies and procedures and then we are done. Number 29, seller sub agency. Okay, as a firm, as a market center, we do not practice seller sub agency. That just means working with an unrepresented buyer. So if the buyer won't hire you as their buyer agent, then we don't practice seller sub agency. Okay, so a sub agent is a person authorized to act on behalf of another. An agent showing a property you have listed to a customer that they do not have a buyer agency agree agreement with is acting as a sub agent to you. We do not compensate seller sub agents. Hence, the answer to sub agency in any agency agreement and in the, ML, uh, the MLS is always going to be no. Should buyer agency not be an action, perhaps uh, an option for an unwilling buyer, then the buyer would remain unrepresented. When dealing with an unrepresented buyer or seller, you still owe the customer the traditional requirements of honesty, fairness, and disclosure of material facts. So what we're saying here is if they won't allow someone to actually represent them in a buyer agency agreement, we're not gonna compensate another agent that gets involved as a seller subagent. So we do not practice seller subagency. And finally, number 30 talks about short sales. Any agent that wishes to list a short sale property must be out of provisional broker status and have attended at least one certified short sale training class. And so there's one that's recommended it's the National Association of Realtors Short Sales and Foreclosure. Here is the link for it. This is the class that's recommended, but you have to take at least one certified short sale training class before you can list a short sale property and you have to uh, remove your provisional status. All short sale listings must be very clear with the seller that the assistance of an attorney is required by the time an acceptable offer is received. Okay, so short sales do require knowledgeable short sale attorneys, and to do them with our firm, the seller has to know that they are going to need an, an attorney to assist them with the short sale. All right, so that completes our policies and procedures, and I thank you all for your time and your attention. Again, they are located in the uh, back office, in the back agent. Uh, on the intranet. So that's where you will find those policies and procedures. And then our final slide of the uh, boot camp here. We just covered those in detail. The final slide is again um, compliance, where to go for help. And we actually did cover this already in the policies and procedures, but just to give you one more. Um, one more review of where to go if you need help. For agent support, if you have non-transaction specific questions, call the big hotline, 336-864-5991. You can email your BIC at brokerincharge832 at gmail.com for transactional questions or if you need BIC signatures, okay? Now, when it comes to complaints, if there's agent concern over a potential complaint, Notify the BIC immediately in order to comply with ENO insurance uh, policy requirements. So if you think that you might have a complaint from a customer, a client, from someone on the other side, if you get a, a, a notice from an attorney, 
um, that there's an issue, any kind of complaint, we ask you to notify us immediately to make sure that you have the, the highest level of protection available through ENO insurance. Thank you all for attending boot camp. Um, this is your last opportunity to ask any questions of me. And uh, if you would like to receive a copy of the um, of this video, by all means, please put it in the chat so that we can make sure we put you on that list. Are there any last questions? Thank you very much. I was a tad late, so I missed your name. I know you're oh. not Keller Williams. It says Keller Williams. <laughs> yes, I am Tiffany Ross. I'm the assistant broker in charge. Okay, thank you, Tiffany. You're very welcome. Okay, Jennifer, I see your email. Okay, so you would like to have a copy of the Zoom. I will make sure they put you on that list. It, would anyone else like the Zoom? Uh, yes, for yesterday as well, please. Okay. And I'll put my email. Thank you. Tiffany, this is Ethiel. I just want to say thank you so much for going over the policies and procedures. I, I think it would actually benefit um, most of our agents to attend um, the, because they are new to our, our market center. Well, Ethiel, thank you for attending and you're very welcome. Um, now that you know where to find them, for any agents that you do uh, encounter, if you would share that information, we do, uh, we are planning on some opportunities for more experienced agents to have a chance to review these in detail as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Arturo. Thank you. All right. Well, you guys have been wonderful. Thank you for your time and your attention. I will make sure that everyone who is uh, in the chat does receive your requested videos and you have a wonderful day. Thanks, Tiffany. You're welcome. Thank you all. Okay, so Jennifer needs to tomorrow, uh, yesterday, yesterday and today, okay. Okay, so that is. Omar Baylor also. Okay. And kw.com. So that would be today, yesterday. Arturo would like today. Is that everyone else up in the chat? All right, there we go.